when I, everyone else had gone up to the, into the, the bar to have a beer and I sort of wandered into the shower feeling pretty sorry for myself and there was just Phil lathering himself up afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> I just topped it off. <laughs> 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 Worth going on, Phil. Thank you to our three sponsors for supporting our podcast. John Russell's Art Caterers and Milltown Pies, who offer fantastic catering services. Alexander Grace Law, who provide modern and client-led legal services. And SBE Furnishings, who offer high-quality furnishings and electrical items at fantastic prices. <laughs> Good afternoon or good morning uh, everyone. Welcome to the Housecast, another podcast that we're putting together. We've got a few ready to go now. Obviously we've got 13 or 14 out now with people keep with the feedback of how they're enjoying them and subscribe to their own providers. It does help us out a lot. Really appreciate all the, all the feedback. The vast majority of it's uh, positive and um, we're enjoying doing them and we'll keep doing them for the foreseeable. So today we've got a special guest on, a young lad who, uh, who prod for us a number of years ago. A lot of us have not seen him for quite a while, maybe had the odd, odd conversation. But I'll come on to him in a minute. We've got some uh, great co-presenters with us today, some proper legends of cricket. Stanley, how are you doing? I'm OK, how are you, Jess? Yeah, fine, thank you. Not a great deal changed from the last time. Anything extraordinary that you've done differently from last time? Well, I've had... I've had a few complaints from my uh, last appearance on the podcast about my about my bad language. Really? Who's asking me from? Yeah, from, from my mum, um, <laughs> from Anne Cochran, Bob Rudson, <laughs> my Auntie Margaret. Oh dear. I've also I've also had a lot of complaints off Sharon. She hasn't actually watched the podcast. She just complains. Yes. <laughs> well, that's good. Watching a podca- podcast to be a clever. Well, let's just listen, should I say. <laughs> so you're in trouble? All well, the time. All I'm the sure, time, Jess. I'm sure you can talk your way out of it. Well, oh, sweet. Still a sweet talker. Always a sweet talker, Stan. <laughs> so we go right down south of the country and we've got Gary Morris back with us. Uh, Gary, thanks for helping out again. Anything changed down in Devon? Nothing yet, Jez. Fourth of July is when it will all explode when uh, people can come on their Hollypops. Um, we'll see what happens then. We haven't had anything like Bournemouth and Brighton beaches. Where people seem to be behaving themselves at the moment. But, uh, yeah, we'll see on 4th of July, I reckon. Yeah, the site's opening then. I believe so, yeah. I think you, they've obviously got to do certain personal space, social distancing, 50% capacity, that type of thing. Yeah. And a lot of them won't, their facilities won't open, I don't think, in the sense of uh, communal areas. But, um, yeah, we'll see. Yeah, well, let's have a look. Yeah, I hope so. Everyone's safe. Um, then, a further co-presenters to uh, to speak to our special our special guest, the one and only Chris Blazard. How are you doing, Chris? Very well, Jeremy. Very well. Good. Good. You much to report? No. Played a bit of golf. Now we're all laid back on the course. Yeah. Played with Francois, Johnny Whited, and Dooch on Friday at Clitheroe. Right. Lovely. How did that go? Uh, Remarkably, I bought a new putter and it sort of worked for a change. I'm sure it'll go in the bin next time I play, but it worked for a day, so... Good lad, I see you're still being spoilt. Lindsay bringing you the biggest bacon butty in the world. It's sausage butty and I made it. She, oh, yeah. she, she basically passed it to me. Yeah, whatever you say. So anyway, let's go on to our guest. This, uh, this podcast is going to be about this individual. Came over to Law House, proing for us in the early 90s. Uh, from Australia, 1995, he came over. It's the one and only Sean Flegler. <laughs> How you doing, Flags? Very good, Jez, and hello to all the other guys. Yeah, good to be here. Good, good to see you guys. 25 years ago, that's crazy. Hello, 25 years ago. 
There's a lot less air on these screens, isn't there? <laughs> and a lot more glasses. <laughs> I'm really good and uh, yeah, great to be on here. Good to catch up with you, with you all. No, that's great, Flex. Thanks very much for coming on and uh, and spending some time with us. It's Sunday evening over there now. So just really, you know, how was things? We have, you know, we, ch we chatted to uh, Ryan and to Andy McDonald previously and I think you've, Australia have had it a little bit easier than we have in the UK. Uh, but how's it affected you personally? And uh, I know you've two young girls, I, I believe, how are they going with it? Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, I think we've been pretty lucky in Australia, obviously. Um, hasn't affected us as much as um, other spots around the world. So um, we're in Brisbane now. So, um, you know, apart from homeschooling for about six or seven weeks at the start of this term, um, you know, we've been stuck at home. Work-wise, you know, I'm at Cricket Australia. I went back to two days a week for, for the last few months and just working from home. Yeah. Um, and there's been quite a bit of change at Cricket Australia. I think we might talk about that a little bit later, but um, everyone starts back full time from, from next week and it's it's still pretty much working from home um, for the next couple of weeks and then slowly people come back into the office. But um, it, I mean, it's been pretty strange. You, you can walk down the street and everything seems normal, but you know, probably about you know, six or seven weeks ago, there was quite a strange period, wasn't it? When everyone was in the house and not getting out and pretty scared to go out at all. So really, really odd time. And, you know, you guys have been affected even more than us. So, I, I, you know, I'd hate to think what it's been like over there, to be honest. Yeah, it has. It's, you know, it has been a difficult period for everyone. And it gets, you know, it's so disappointing that the last um, update from Boris was that Domestic cricket, you know, still nowhere, no, you know, it's not on the horizon at all for us to play, which is disappointing for us all, obviously. So, Fledge, you've, you know, you've mentioned there about Cricket Australia. You're the high performance manager, I believe. Is that right for, for the women's cricket in Australia? Yeah, that's right. Um, so, I started that role about six and a half years ago. Um, okay. Yeah, so based up here at the National Cricket Centre. Um, and another pro, uh, Matthew Mott. Uh, he, uh, yeah. he literally works about three metres away from me when we're in the office. So, yeah. Um, yeah and, and then Ryan, obviously, you know, was at Cricket Australia for a few years as well, and his role yeah. has just finished, unfortunately. But, yeah, um, yeah and, and now Andrew McDonald is an assistant coach. So it's, it's quite bizarre. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> some ex-pros who uh, have all seen join together and working at Cricket Australia, I have done. Yeah, fantastic. So you've been at, you've been doing that role for for six years, you say? Yeah, six and a half years at at CA. Uh, I worked for a few years. Well, I did one year at Queensland Cricket just as a, a player development manager, and that's basically looking after um, players and their off field pursuits. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, quite ironic. I had no idea what I was going to do in my life, and end up trying to help people do that. Yeah. And then before I worked as a as a coach for four years at Cricket Victoria, so I was the second eleven coach. And when the Big Bash started up, I was an assistant coach to the Melbourne Stars as well. Um, and before that, I was in IT for seven or eight years. Um, yeah, a little bit strange working in IT. I've got no idea what I was doing in there, but yeah, did it for a few years. Yeah. No, that's interesting. No, that's interesting. I've you know looking at the research and you know chatting to a few of the others. I think you do. The similar job for Cricket Australia as uh, as Finchy does for for England. Yeah, I do. Um, so it's good to catch up with Finchy. We uh, we well, we see each other at most of the world events and the Ashes I saw him last year and um, a couple of tours to South Africa. I've, I've seen him as well. So we speak to each other pretty regularly. So yeah, again, just a you know, cricket's fantastic for that, isn't it? You just you know this small little world you just bump into people that um you know have all these different connections so so he's a big guy finchy um jury's out probably from you guys on him but he's not a bad guy <laughs> no yeah, yeah he's, a, he's a great fella and he's been a great asset to the cricket club you know when he when he came to us and the the runs he scored and the wickets he scored but he uh he doesn't half talk a lot about the, the england ladies he's non-stop telling us what he's doing it's about right but in dressing room as well isn't it Absolutely. Uh, and it's always good if Fledge is struggling to sleep to, to have him on a loop, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, just to get yourself to sleep. Um, so that's interesting, that, Sean. So that's, um, you know, that, that's good. And let's hope that, you know, once all this is over, that things continue to go in the in the way that they are for yourself, you know, and for, for the female cricket in, in Australia, you know, and throughout the world. Before we go on to your cricket in prowesses at Law House, just want to give us a bit of a resume about yourself. Uh, I know you, you know, you were at Victoria and at Queensland, I believe, when you played there. Uh, just want to talk us through, through how you started cricket, where you, you know, where you first made a breakthrough, how your, you know, your first class career went. Uh, yep, it's a pretty short-lived first class career, unfortunately. Um, so I played most of my junior cricket. Uh, in Queensland, so I grew up in Queensland, um, lived out in the country for a little bit and then moved in, into Brisbane and, and played at uh, Queensland Uni, um, so a couple of guys there, Michael Kastrovich uh, was there and um, a few other first class players, so we had quite a good team then and I was sort of in the state squad um, pretty early on and um, went to the Cricket Academy in 1992. So some of the guys in the academy of my year were uh, McGrath and Ponting, the freak. He was, he was just, you know, an absolute standout. Funnily enough, McGuire probably wasn't the standout. He was just, you know, as, you, as he played his test cricket, he was just relentless on a line and length. So you probably didn't recognise that yeah. at the time. He was, but he had a, you know, insatiable work ethic and competitiveness that, you know the, the best players have so yeah, yeah. Um, so those two guys were the standouts um so yeah i just was in the queensland squad for a few years I played one game for queensland yeah the year they won their sheffield shield their, their sheffield shield in 94 95 so i came in for a guy called paul jackson who was a left arm spinner um he'd broken his finger the game before um they tried to keep it a secret for ages and end up uh, making my debut with Matthew Mott and Andrew Simons in the same game um, at the SCG. So Alan Border was the uh, captain of Queensland and we played against a full strength New South Wales team. So uh, Taylor, Slater, the War Brothers, Michael Bevan, Greg Matthews, um, McGrath, uh, Shane Lee. So they, they were a pretty good team and we got beaten in, in about three days. <laughs> um, I got a I, I failed miserably. I didn't get a wicket. Um, no runs, hardly any runs. Yeah, it was it was a nightmare. So uh, that was the only game I played for Queensland. I was twelfth man for a few games, thirteenth man for a few games. So I ended up moving to um, to Victoria. So after I played for Low House, sort of ninety five, ninety six, the following winter, so ninety ninety seven, I moved to Melbourne. Right. And end up in a few games for Victoria, a few Shield games, and um, and some one day as as well uh, for I don't know three or four years, and then finished up first class cricket. I actually haven't retired from first class cricket, so just in case, I don't think you ever retired, do you? So no. just get moved on. Yeah. Um, so about two thousand, I think, was my last my last game. Right. Uh, for Victoria. Uh, so I mean, that was great. We won a. A one-day title in Victoria as well. That was good fun. So, see Shane Warne was there at the time. Um, yeah. Got to play a few games with him as well. It was fun. It was. A, I mean, it was a, a great time to be involved in cricket. It was just starting to come into the professionalisation of the game. So, yeah. I think my my last contract I earned twelve and a half thousand dollars, and that was that was uh, that was the big dollars back then. Um, and then. Uh, I don't know, I had two shoulder operations and I was umming and ahhing what to do because uh, they used to offer contracts sort of in April, they'd offer set contracts and then they'd hold off a few until September. And I just had a full RICO on my shoulder and uh, they said, oh, look, we, we're not going to offer you a contract in April, but see how you work over the winter and, you know, you might be offered a contract in September. I was like, and I at the end of that season, I'd... I'd just wondering what I could do, whether well, I should go back and go to uni and do something with my life. I was 28 at the time, and the, basically the director of cricket, uh, Sean Graff, he's still there at Cricket Victoria now. He just said, look, you're 28, you're going to be there or thereabouts for a few years. You can either do that or you can get on with your life. So <laughs> I ended up signing up to this IT course that was like, pay 10 grand and you get guaranteed a job at the end of 
three months of study. So I was like, oh, shit, okay. Um, 10 grand, I'm not getting paid a great deal. And then I have these clubs in Melbourne, the sub-districts club. And this club just came out of the blue and said, oh, we'll give you 10 grand cash to play for us next season. And I was like, okay, well, I can take that or I can get 12 and a half grand with Victoria, maybe, if I find out in September. So end up taking the 10 grand cash to try and pay off the 10 grand that I paid for the IT course. And, um, and that was it, pretty much. So I played a bit more cricket after that, but I actually got into IT and um, worked in that for a bit. I met my, my then wife, or my now wife, sorry, my now wife. I met her, <laughs> I met her in, uh, when I was in Melbourne. And so we decided we'd travel around the world. So I went and coached in Vancouver in Canada. Um, and we had, I had a coaching job lined up in Argentina for a bit that fell through. So I ended up just traveling through South America and then coached in Dublin, came back through Africa and then played a couple more years of district cricket in Melbourne and then got back into, into IT, I guess, and ended up working, working for Microsoft and Dell computers for a bit. Yeah. And then in the blue, we're living in Sydney. I got a call out of the blue from Cree Victoria saying, do you want to come back and coach? So I got a job back in coaching. Yeah, moved the family back to, from Sydney back to Melbourne. Did that for a few years and then uh, got offered a job up in Queensland. It's been great. Um, you know, cricket, cricket's given me a lot of stuff. I'm extremely fortunate of I work. You know, I don't really call it work. I've worked in IT for seven or eight years and hated every day of it. Um, you know, I've worked in cricket for the last sort of 10 or 11 years and, you know, it's, it's been brilliant. It's been a very, very fortunate that I get to do what I do. So. Fantastic. Did you, so did you do your coaching badges before you finished? So after you'd finished in 2001-ish? Uh, I'd, I'd sort of done some coaching beforehand. Um, so you have three, level, th level one, level two, level three okay. over here. Um, so I think I'd done my level two when I was in Victoria. Uh, and then and then as soon as I, I did my start of the coaching job in, in Melbourne, they just put me through a level three course then as well. Yeah. You talked about your reconstruction on your shoulder. Was that a, an impact injury or just a wear and tear injury? Sure. I actually had an injury to my left shoulder and, and the crack that I bowled, I think. <laughs> yeah. So I, don't, I, had a, I had an operation that I had to get done on my left. So it was a, um, oh, it was a slap lesion, a slap tear. So I had to get that done. And I was actually playing a game of touch football, so touch rugby. <laughs> Um, and I was actually with uh, Moddy and um, a couple other cricketers. And it was like two nights before I was supposed to get this operation done. And I actually went and dived in the corner and was thinking that I needed to dive and not land on my left shoulder and went to dive on my right and actually hit my right shoulder. And I had to get a full Rico done on my right shoulder after doing it, playing touch, <laughs> touch rugby. So they gave me the option. They said you could get both shoulders done at the same time and at that time I was, I was actually living with Moddy and another guy John Davison who played for Victoria and played for Canada um, and so it was like well who's going to wipe my ass for the next six weeks so I put off my left one got my right one done and then 12 months later I got my left one done. <laughs> I thought you were going to say you had them both done at the same time then under the anaesthetic. <laughs> yeah, so yeah I mean, the, the right one was was hard work it was um, yeah, a full Rico you know, you're in a sling for two months, and and that was that was pretty tough. The left one wasn't as bad; it was still um, still can't throw properly from it. So I just heard uh, John Davidson mentioned there, and that name seemed that name cropped up while you were at Lorax. Did you end up in Canada because of John Davidson? Well, probably <coughs> really for him. He he did play a few years in Canada. He played in Toronto. Another guy, uh, guy called Brad Murphy, who's he's an Aussie guy who's bit of a player manager as well so he's placed a few players in England um, and he coached over there for a couple of years and it was just sort of out of the blue he just said oh look you're interested in, in playing in Canada yeah it was it was outstanding it was it was such a fun time it was, and it was really good for, for me at the time because I'd become pretty bitter with the injuries that I had with cricket and then you go to a place like that that they're sort of they're putting up sight screens they're rolling out the the coy and matting and, and rolling the pitch before the game and you know I was on the the ride on mower cutting the turf before the game it was so it, it just 
remind me of why I played the game. I, I really, really enjoyed it. So good fun. And Vancouver was an amazing, amazing place to live. It was beautiful. So. Whereabouts um, in Vancouver were you, Flags? Linz has got family over in Mission. So right. you've been over there quite a few times. Yeah, we're in Kitsilano, yeah. which is a really good spot. Um, so we're there for most of the time, actually, in Kits. So really good. But Davo, who has also worked for Cricket Australia for quite a bit as well. So I played against him through youth cricket. He's from New South Wales. But uh, So Moddy, Davo and myself all lived in a house in Melbourne for a bit, for a couple of years. Um, and he, he lives in Brisbane now. He still coaches. And, you know, we're all sort of going in the same circles for, yeah. for 25 years. Yeah, so it's interesting that, you know, the, the different cricket all over the world and it's becoming more and more, you know, certainly with the franchise cricket, the, the T10s and the T20s that are, that are propping up everywhere. I think Canada have only just recently had one, haven't they? They have. They're, I think their cricket's actually gone uh, backwards a little bit. They they had some some really good players there for a while um, and had a quite a good setup. But there's lots of different factions. So on the West Coast, they um, you know, there's one faction on the East Coast in Toronto, there's another one, and they're just fighting against her all, all the time. And it's the same in the US as well. I think there's, they're trying, I think they've just put a few guys from the ICC into the US just to try and build that market a little bit better because you just, you've got guys in New York against the guys in San Francisco and then folks down in Florida. If you get that right, you know, the game is going to explode. So, but, you know, the, the great thing about cricket, you, you can pretty much go anywhere in the world and, you lob up and there's a game. Like when we were traveling through South America, I actually played a game in Santiago for this private private golf club. Yeah. It was ridiculous. It cost about forty thousand US a yeah. year to join this or to be in this golf club. And there's rugby fields and then these private cricket grounds. So they had all the these expats coming in and playing, you know, eight or ten games of cricket for the summer. But it was and I lobbed up with my backpack on and yeah, it was yeah. very funny. Molly, your Chinamans or your Wazims. I've all seen him up, so yeah, little Wazims. Yeah, I guess really, it was just from your first class days, trying to make it in those years, how far ahead were you looking? Were you thinking of, of it being a, a permanent cricket? I know you, you dived into IT and it was like possibly the, like the financial reason. Was that deep inside you that you always wanted to stay in cricket and coach and, and do even or administration or anything just to do with, with, with cricket at all? I always wanted to stay in the game if I could. Um, and so I always coached even through you know, my playing days towards the end as well. I, sort of captain coach of, of Melbourne Uni for a couple of years. And that was probably, I got, so a guy called Jeff Allardyce, who I lived with in Melbourne when I f- sort of first moved down to Melbourne. He's now the ICC general manager of cricket. And James Sutherland was the CEO of Cricket Australia. They both played at Melbourne Uni. I always wanted to sort of keep involved in cricket. And I, I just didn't know how I'd do it. Um, so it was actually, it was good getting out of Cricket and getting into IT, I think, just gave me a different perspective. Working at Microsoft and you have all these Indian guys working at Microsoft and you go down to lunch and, they, you know, I don't know, they end up finding out what you used to do and they'd be sitting there going, what are you doing, you know, working in IT? Why aren't you involved in cricket? Jerry Sutherland, uh, so proud for us at Richton, didn't he? Uh, can you remember his clip? Yeah. So, so he bowled right-handed, I think. Yeah. And, and, it and threw it left-handed and he... And he, yeah. who was it he ran out? Because they just didn't realise. He's running down the boundary, so like third man or something. And obviously they knew he was right-hand bowler. So, yeah, come on, two. Yeah. And he pings it about flat as, a, flat as you like over the top of the bales and runs this guy by half a pitch, left-handed. Nicky and Charlie, Frank and Stan got stuck in a ball to loop. Charlie tossed one in the air and Frank and follow through. What's your thought about corruption in these countries, the new countries that are coming up to play cricket? You know, there's this new European Super League, isn't there? Have you seen that? That's the danger with it, isn't it? There's, yeah. Maybe I was really naive but yeah. when I played, that I just missed stuff. Um, I don't know, maybe I got some cheap wickets as well. I got Sanjay Mandraker out in Middlesbrough. <laughs> he, was, he was not missing the bat. You know, he cruised his way to 50 when I was playing at Middlesbrough. And then he just got out. I'm like, how'd that happen? <laughs> you have a leather jacket on your on your quarter when you're back in. <laughs> yeah. 
yeah. So, yeah. It, it's correct. It's right to the top, I reckon. That's that's the scary stuff. So. It is. It's actually surreal. And I, I mean, it's it's public record now. But I've went in about two years ago. I worked on a bribery investigation, and what the cricketer got sent to prison that I'd worked on. So I got really into it and worked out like you know, it's clearly all the um, Indian bookmakers that are just targeting you know Asian mainly Pakistani young cricketers that have been groomed from the start of the careers that you will do as we tell you yeah well, there's there's actually a real danger with with women's cricket now because of you know there's quite a discrepancy between you know what we pay compared to um, some of the other countries yeah and you know there there's some huge viewing numbers now with the game with the girls so um yeah it's they're right for the taking to be honest so um, you know we, cricket australia invests quite a bit of money into it but i know other countries don't no. um, it's a bit good to watch finchie and Broyle in some anti-corruption dispute <laughs> doing six doing six months we'll get rolled out, <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. So, Flags, you've you know you've done your uh, you've, you've gone through the career what you've done there, and it's interesting that you came to Law House in 1995. Um, as we've just discussed off air, it's 25 years ago, and it seems unreal that it is that long ago. Can you can you just give us um, you know the circumstances of how it came about, how you you signed for Lower House and what the build-up was through the, you know, from 94 maybe, from when you first got approached? So I was playing at Middlesbrough in 94. The team had an unbelievable season, pretty much won everything apart from one uh, and we're in the semi-finals for, for some midweek cup and everything else we won, we smashed it. We had a really, really good team. I was going to sign for them again and I can't remember whether... Renners must have approached me. I can't remember the timing of it, but yeah. I pretty much for Middlesbrough, I'd said, all I want, I want 500 pounds more. I got 3,000 pounds at Middlesbrough and I was going to sign for three and a half thousand pounds. And they said, no, we'll give you 3,250. I went, right, okay. David got in touch with me somehow. And it turns out, I think he actually came and watched me play, which I didn't know about. Yeah, I just had this offer from from you guys and I always wanted to play in the Lancashire League. I'd always heard about it and, you know, it's a great league to play in. So, you know, I was really excited. I thought, brilliant. Definitely want to play down there. It sounded like a really tough league. Some really good pros played there. I was, yeah, uh, you know, I, I loved my two years at Lower House, to be honest. Yeah. I, I really... Yeah. That's interesting. I mean, Gary, obviously, that was your second year as captain. Yeah. You had Craig, Craig Light the year before. Were you, can you, I know it's, it's difficult, I can't remember any of it, but can you remember any of the, the approaches? Because I know Ren, uh, Renner's, you know, God rest his soul, he really had visions, in, but he kept everything to himself as far as I, I can remember. He would come up with this idea, right, we've got so-and-so that can bowl, so-and-so that can bat, we need this type of pro, and then just go off very successfully, I might add. Can you remember what, what happened around then, Gaz? It, it was... We, we sat down and we just had a look. I would say it was a, it was a shit season results-wise. Um, and, and Craig, as good a talent as a batter as he was, obviously his, his head was in space somewhere. Um, and he, um, we, we looked at it and we said, well, look, Baker could have finished second or something, whoever it was. Or, you know, and we finished second from bottom. What's the difference between the two sides? Okay, you know, if they have Roger Harper they, or somebody like that, then you know, that's a pretty big difference. But... When you look down at amateur for amateur, you know, you Blaze, Peter Thompson, you yourself, Jez, Dave Ormrod, you know, you'd maybe Stan, Terry Lord or whatever. And you look down the, the, the averages and the results in the run, run squad. I know it doesn't tell you everything in terms of match situations, but you thought, well, everybody, you know, those sort of people are contributing. They're on the first page of the league averages at the end of the season, et cetera, et cetera. Why are we 14 wins away from, you know, their end of season? And, and and it, we came down to it that we weren't competing on both sides of the ball. And, and from that, you know, I think once we'd had that conversation, I think it was a case of getting a professional in. Obviously, there were other attributes we needed as far as 
youngsters coaching and, and, and getting the best out of the amateurs and really building something collective going forward. But I think once we'd had that discussion, I think he had it in his mind then to go and get a genuine all-rounder who, you know, if we screwed up in the first innings, we were still in it in the second innings because he can take eight wickets or he can smash an 80 or whatever. Yeah. And I think that's where he set off. I don't think we ever discussed, do we need left arm, you know, right. spin, etc. I mean, that, that was a massive, you know, I think thing for Auras. You look at players around the time, Roscoe, Tracy, whatever, similar, who, who, you know, they did very well, didn't they, in the league for years, this sort of left armers. And it was a very, you know, for an average amateur, um, you know, it, it, it was always a tricky prospect. So if, to get a quality pro uh, left arm spinner, I think turned out to be a massive bonus for us as well. But, he, you know, you're right about Dave. He, he didn't really... I'm looking at this person, what do you think of this person, whatever. He went off on a mission. Um, and, and to be fair, you look at the people we had in, in that decade and, and Ken Smalley as well. You know, we got some quality people and, and you know, it was clearly at the time the overall average, uh, the amateur strength that wasn't up to it. Um, but yeah, I think signing a, a Sean was, was perfect timing for us, perfect timing. It was, and, it, and again, you know, it, it's not luck that Dave Wren found professionals like flags because you know the amount of quality that we've had and that have been just right for us has been outstanding so and that is a theme that's running through these podcasts you know around how how fantastic Renners was and you know cracky how much we miss him all can you remember much about that Blaise about that year because you were you know you're, you're obviously doing extremely well quite you know toward getting a lot of runs each year can you remember flags coming into the team yeah, I could just I can just remember the you know Sean's enthusiasm, you know, and his his sort of his joyousness of playing cricket, and you know his intensity, you know how 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 much he wanted to win, you know, and we probably weren't we probably weren't ready for that, you know, that massive switch, you know, we all got on board with it, but I don't think we had the that sort of intensity behind us and we you know we got on board with it and we you know we we really loved every minute of it if we'd have had that 10 years later I think it would have been far more successful you know maybe it was the quality wasn't quite there or maybe it was the experience wasn't quite there but you know for me it was a, a joyous season just to have somebody care as much as we did yeah, yeah, it's a it's a good summary of that Blaze because that is, you know, albeit, you know, I wasn't a spring chicken back then, but it was a big change for us, weren't it? We've got Gary coming in, you know, Gary von Mooresen, cracking the whip, uh, banging everyone's heads together, um, and and it's a complete change to what it had been, you know, for for a decade before, where it was a little bit, you know. We, we fly by the seat of our pants, we train if we want to train, we don't train if we don't. But when flags came, I do remember that, you know, the nets were very well, you know, very well uh, attended by all the players. What's your thoughts about it, Stanley? Because you would, how old would you have been in 95? 22. No, I'd, I'd have been 21 in 95. Um, and you played quite um, a lot. I was like tw well, 22 at end of the season. Yeah. But well, it, it's just, just on what Blaise said, really, you, if you, if you think back, we had Cameron, and a lot of us weren't quite ready for it. I think Cameron's intentions were were well set, but I just didn't think, especially some of us younger players, then were quite ready for that because of what we've been brought up through. Yeah. The, the years leading up to it, we were like completely different, and then Big Light didn't really sort of care that much about it to want to make anyone else better. So I always thought, what, once we got fled, used to flags, which was pretty quickly. I think that's when it that's sort of when it started. But the improvement sort of started there, and how we went about things, and how how you could get better as an individual. You know, there's lots of people listen to the podcast, Blake. Like, so I'll, you know, I'll just try and describe what type of critter I thought you were. You know, obviously very talented, bat ball fielding, absolutely outstanding. And when we say that that Flegs influenced us, you know, immensely, he wasn't a shouter, he wasn't a screamer. It was just on the field. He would, you knew you, you, you know, he had your back. You knew that he was every every ball was supporting every member of the team, and you just felt it from you. What were your initial thoughts, uh, Flegs, when you came to the club and you, know, you met up with Gary and and you saw the facilities 
etc. What were your initial thoughts, maybe compared with Middlesbrough? So Middlesbrough is a, was used as a county down to Yorkshire. Oh, right. um, so unbelievable wicket, you know, outfield, outstanding, you know, just, you know, very, very schmick. <laughs> it, was, it was good. I, I remember um, David picked me up from the airport and I reckon I went to the pub the first night. He dropped me in. I met a few of the guys that night. It's, it's cool. Guys are good. And then I saw the ground and the big slope. I was like, wow, this is different. But, but then I, I actually started thinking, well, how, how can I use that to my advantage a little bit as well? So I, I just, I loved, I actually, I genuinely loved playing for Lower House because, you know, once you start playing, you hear people talking about it and, you know, you hear the other players, oh, you know, you playing for Toilet House. And I was just like, oh, I loved playing at Lower House. That, sort of gave me even more, I don't know, a bit of shit about me, I think. Um, <laughs> I love beating other teams. And, um, I don't know, it was just a real genuine family club, you know, um, you know, Bomber and yeah. Matt, Nicky. I just, you know, I love that about it. And, you know, Gary was, I could tell, you know, he was, he, he was wanting to change things. So, you know, I remember some early conversations. He was wanting to make a, a difference and I really appreciate the words. I, I hope I did make some sort of difference. So, you know, that's all you want to do as, as a player. You want to, you want to try and improve the team and, and that's what I tried to do. And I, yeah, I've got a bit of white line fever and that hasn't gone away probably. So Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah you did, Flex. You definitely did make a difference. And as we do for all these podcasts, we always between us do a little bit of research and look and it brings back great memories. Me and Gary chat for hours about Crikey, hey, you know, look at, look at the amount of runs Bles got. Or can you remember this game as you're reading through it? And there's some great stats throughout that season, you know, and some you know, some decent pros. The first game of the season, just to bring it out, you know, I, I struggle to remember many of these, but playing Rottenstall away on the first game of the season. And you, I mean, you you, you always, I think, under, underestimated your own bowling flags. You, you, but, you, you know, you got some serious wickets in that season you know, against some sides and won some games for, you know, your first game, 31 for three off 13 overs and we beat them with 25 overs to spare. I mean, I can't particularly remember it. Any, anyone else remember that game? I can, because it was first ever game with Fielding Circle, weren't it? Really? And, yeah. Uh, yeah. And uh, I took a catch. And didn't, know if I could leap, <laughs> didn't know if I could leap circle. <laughs> <laughs> ended, up, ended up diving to catch it. <laughs> so... Well, let's just get this right, Stanley. There's a T skeleton, caught Stansfield ball Flegler. Yeah. The ball's gone up in the air at the 25 metre circle. You Possibly, need, yeah. You need and to I, get I, out of it to catch it. And what did you do? I were at mid off and I was shouting to mid on, which I think you were fair. Can I, can, I come, can I leave? Can I leave? <laughs> Ended up yeah. diving backwards yeah. and catching it. So, please, we're lucky, really, at that time. I was 50-50 around that time, but yeah, I held that one. You get pulled up now and then between Moddy and I, um, because you drifted. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> that would have been a world, that would have been a world, eh? <laughs> <laughs> was that loud now? So I remember, I think I was celebrating beforehand. Yeah. And you dropped it. Uh, yeah, I, lost you, I mean, I, my, my first memory of legs coming, actually, were sort of realising I was due to her, really. Because if you remember, and I, I, God knows we arranged this, but they took us all off up to Scarborough. Do you remember yeah. that? They took yeah. us to Scarborough for a pre-season friendly. Yeah. And uh, it, we were going sort of representing the Lancashire League at that point. And, um, and Scarborough decided they were going to beat us. And... The ringers playing and the like nobbled umpires, you know, Scarborough were winning this game. Do you, uh, you remember what? Do you remember what day it was, Danny? It, it was, was Easter it, Saturday. Easter Saturday, we played. We played Good Friday against the grammar school Jets. We had, yeah, yeah. We'd all been playing football at Belvedere, yeah. And, and that, was went, not, that was not a good journey up. <laughs> I can I can remember, and we got there, and if if you remember, I said I said they brought some ringers in, but one of them weren't Roger Harper. And I'm going to have to bring him up, but I can remember Stan making a painstaking six step, which it felt like it took him best part of a week to compile while we, whilst we were all sat there watching. But what, 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 what I remember about Flegs, why he was so astute, because if you remember 
Matt was sort of social secretary then, weren't they? We all, we all sort of danced to Matt's tune. And I can remember going in bar at Scarborough. And Matt had decided on where to stop, but we, we were stopping in Scarborough. So fair enough. And uh, we was just sat in the bar at Scarborough and uh, they clearly didn't want us there. So Matt said, well, I'll go out into Scarborough, I'll find some digs. I think he took Chippy with him. And they, they set off out into Scarborough. And I can remember Phil Astin saying, well, me, me flakes Phil Astin sat there. And <laughs> Phil Astin said, you'll not find anywhere because it's Easter weekend. Ten minutes later, Dober stopped and Matt had found somewhere. And I think Flegs, Flegs sort of said, I've got some friends I need to go and visit. And I'm thinking, he's only been here 48 hours, who can he be going to visit? So we, we got in this car and uh, we, got in, we, got, we, we loaded the cars up and head to this hotel and we got there. And I'll never forget that the guy stood at the door, looked like Agrid out at Harry Potter movies. And he took, he took £12 a piece, I think there were six of us, and he took £12 a piece off us, did this guy. And he like lifted, corrugated, pulled corrugated sheet back and let us in. And then he pissed off. There were no keys, there were no keys to rooms or anything. There weren't, no one were given a key. So we went upstairs, we walked up these stairs and we walked in the, Payne kicks this door open. Now we're in with Brock and Payne and Payne kicks this door open. And I can remember turning to Brock and saying, have you got any Johnnies? Because I'm not sleeping in here tonight without a Johnny on. <laughs> <laughs> And I, I can remember from I can remember thinking the day after on the way back to Burma, I thought, this this new pro, this new lad's dodged a bullet a bullet here because he's he's gonna think we're absolute dickheads. <laughs> and we had a we had a good night, but we did have a good night in Scarborough. And uh, and he soon joined in with us did flags after that. But, I mean the, the other thing that night, we all ordered a taxi a piece, went to a taxi rank and ordered six individual taxis and got them all to take us take us back to this hotel in a big convoy. And then when drivers realised what was going on, they sort of wanted to have a fight with us this hotel. We could have done a trip in two taxis and we took six. Good memory, it's good memory, that's stunning. Yeah. Um, I mean, I remember the start of the season, well, I don't remember, I just through research we're doing, that we had quite a decent start, Gary, if, uh, if I remember. What, one, we've won probably eight of the first ten? We did have a good start, you're right. And I think that summer was, um, was relatively decent weather. Yeah. Um, I don't think there were many, overall those two seasons. Maybe I don't think there were many no result games at all. Yeah. Um, and so that helped. Um, I'm not saying they were, you know, hard bouncy wickets that a left arm uh, spinner would would enjoy uh, bowling on by any stretch. But I think it helped generally just in terms of having competitive games, full full, you know, games that went the full distance. And we spoke about it before, you know, there were some pretty good pros knocking around then, test players, etc. So it was even more encouraging that, uh, that we had made a good start. You know, players were country, uh, doing his usual stuff. Uh, Stan and, uh, and Nicky were playing uh, reasonable at the top of the order. People who were chipping, chipping in, Lloyd Ain. The bowling-wise was, I think, the biggest improvement for us. You know, if you look at the, the overall stats then, I think, you know, it was always good to captain there. I, I always felt I had options. Yeah. You know, whether, you know, great if Sean's time won't end up or your, your time won't end up. But you know, with, with Matt and Stanny in particular, you know, both chipping in for, you know, 20-odd, 30-odd wickets a, each season, you always felt you, you had options. And each, each one of the four of your bowling there were always capable of getting pros out as well. It wasn't just down to Sean hopefully getting their pro and then, you know, we were in it. I think you look down the, the, the results and I was, I was really pleased with how the bowling lineup sort of came together. And I think that, that made a big difference to the start. We were, we were practicing better as well, Gary. We were definitely, at that point, we were definitely practicing better. That, you know, it did yeah. change. We, 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 the first we, were, but I, I, we were standing, but I don't think that had a massive instant effect. I think that took a, a while to get in. You know, I think the fielding overall gradually did get mapped hugely better, you know, the catching, the, yeah. just the, the backing up, the throwing, uh, despite some uh, amazing uh, practice sessions where we nearly killed about four people by yeah. flags as in innovative fielding regime and catching regimes. I can remember us killing a cat. Broken ankles, fingers. Broken ankles, fingers. Jesus, yeah. I can remember us killing a cat when I bowled at Blaze and we took a cat <laughs> out of <took> car park. <laughs> yeah. So I, I think you're right, uh, James. That that start just helped, probably show, make you know, get confidence shown. You know, feeling around the club, 
players all buying into everything, membership happy at the top at the right end of the table in the early parts of the season. Um, yeah, I think it was a good start. Yeah, I mean, you look at, like I said, and Fleggs, you you know, you contributed straight away. You know, you had a seven for, seven for in the fourth game. You had a 90, an 82 not out, 64 not out, 61. So, and, and you don't have league tables, do you? You know, you, you don't see league tables after sixth game or tenth game. So, it's difficult to know how we were going. And, you know, we did finish sixth, but we were three points off, off third, if you remember. You know, it was all it was it was all extremely tight. I remember I do remember playing against Accrington at home and they had Colin Miller. Can you remember that game, Flags? I remember the away game we beat them. I think I might have hit a six or something to to win the game there. I remember that one. The one at home I don't remember playing. We beat them home and away. The game at home we beat them by and I can't obviously I'm just getting this from the stats. We beat them by 122 runs, absolutely battered them. And I'm assuming Miller was bowling team yeah. up there. Colin Miller was still being pissed, for sure. Yeah, <laughs> yeah possibly. <laughs> but he, he still bowled 19 overs and uh, and got 42. Uh, he we had, very good yeah. yeah. Yeah, we bashed him. I think Stan got a 50 there. Blaise got 60-odd. You got 60-odd. Yeah, um, you know, we beat them there. And other pros, what's your memories around that season, Flags, that you've, you know, whether, you know, a few bits and bats that you've read since or, or what you can remember around it with the different pros and our performances? Yeah, so, I mean, the big one was Alan Donald's. That was huge, that signing. And, you know, there's a lot of buzz around the league, I think, with him signing on. Yeah. And I still remember him just, he was cleaning up teams for fun. Uh, and there were stories of, you know, some of the clubs wetting the foot marks on one side and so he'd come around the wicket and still clean up. And so Bomber yeah. had this great idea that he'd put, loam over our wicket or the topsoil over the wicket yeah. without anyone knowing I think that, that we turned up and I remember turning up and said what layer over the top of the wicket that end up playing like it was horrendous some were shooting along yeah. the ground others were like kicking up it was a nightmare I remember I reckon I faced I think he bowled 13 overs straight from the clubhouse and I reckon I faced 12.3 overs of it <laughs> I nearly got through and then I loved one. I think we got knocked over about 90. And then we had them like seven or eight down. And he ended up he to win the game. Might have, yeah. I think he, he just crept over the line. But, so there was him. Uh, Franklin Rose was an interesting cat. He, uh, Last game of the season was phenomenal. That's nice to see. <laughs> <Yeah>. um, <laughs> Um, Frank, Frank came back in the dressing room, didn't he? And said, He's just trying to kill him, to shoot him. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> what can you remember about that, uh, Flags or Blaise? Just talk us through that last game. I think it was, obviously, I think Franklin Rose had, had, had fallen out with Andy Barker. Andy Barker was captain of Benfield, weren't he? Yeah. And uh, there were rumours that they hadn't eventually got on very well. I think, were we batting second in that game? And, yeah. You know, we got somewhere near creeping up to their total, but then you know most of our you know top top five or six had got out, and Frank had gone into bat. And Frank is used to just winding people up, and he was in the middle of his you know wind up merchant sort of phase. Really, Franklin Rose had sort of lost the plot with Andy Barker during the game, and he seemed to be sort of like feeding Frank you know four balls, and Frank just kept clattering them. And Andy Barker's exasperated, throwing his hands up. And old Frank came in and said, Franklin Rawls has just threatened Andy Barker that if he didn't shut up, he would shoot him. <laughs> <laughs> That's his own captain. <laughs> yeah. We were chasing 171 that game and we, and we, we top scored with 47 extras. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was firing him in all directions with Franklin and Rose. Um, uh, anything else around that season, Flegs, or, or anyone else on there before we move on? Roger Harper was was great. I still remember him. The fields that he used to bowl to, was a, it wasn't a normal mid-on and mid-off. It was extra wide mid-off and extra wide mid-on. Short legs, silly mid-off, slip gully. And then he'd bowl and just extend his arms like an albatross. And you, he was unbelievable. But it was so good, you know, Playing against him, uh, yeah. I can remember a game, Jez. The one where we we'd got an early wicket at church, 
you've you done your you've done your research and Neil Johnson were walking in. <laughs> Neil Johnson were walking to crease and Jez, uh, Jez informs us he's right handed and piss porks are about the rate right 121 with 17 overs left. <laughs> Batting left handed, yeah. Yeah, I do. I, I, do. I don't know where I got that from. I might have been thinking of Ben Johnson. <laughs> he didn't push talk about it, did he? Phil no. <laughs> Simmons was the other one as well. Yeah, he prodded, yeah, we risked him, weren't they? Yeah, so that was, it was 96, that one, I think. Simmons played, didn't he? Oh, yeah, he was at Rishton 95. 95, yeah. yeah. Did, we, did we win that Neil Johnson game, Stanley? Did you, were you, I had a look at that. I think no. You, did we not? I'm no. sure we, I, I, maybe I've read, read the wrong thing. I'm sure you ended up two not out and won. And that, were, that were at home, that. That were at home. Yeah, yeah. We, we, we were something like 110 for eight, Chase, 160, and uh, Matt and Chippy got us win two. Yeah. And then uh, come of the hour, come of the man. <laughs> Might have been my first runs at season now, they wait September. So, <laughs> that were off Neil Johnson, yeah, eating for yeah. two, yeah. Yeah, that was the last game of the season, that was, Stanley, yeah. And you've, yeah, uh, yeah. I didn't score many runs, so I weren't renowned for me. Prowess with a bat, Jess. No, but you won the game. Oh, I ate Neil McGarrell for six, if you want to research. I can't remember when that was. <laughs> he played Test cricket. The Rishton away game, Blaise, I think, where you got a couple of wickets, can you remember that? No. Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> okay. no. <laughs> Phil Simmons. <laughs> yeah. you know, when you, a bit like me putting, you, you got a bit of the yips after about five balls because you all weren't used to it. And I just dropped one, dropped one short and I just, I just went, oh, shit. <laughs> he, he rocked back and just waited for it. We all ducked. <laughs> Everybody ducked. He yeeted it. And we'd eat it straight at Ryan. Did we, we caught Ryan Asker? Pesky, yeah. Pesky caught it. Yeah, caught it at mid wicket. And he, as soon as he hit, he went, Oh no! That's <laughs> <laughs> um, But then that year, you know, we always, because we rated ourselves, you know, we've got some decent amateurs. And then you get a good pro in like Flag, you know, underneath, I think, certainly like Samir and Blaise, you know, probably the older end in Stan would always want a good cup run. Um, yeah, and you know, once again, if you look at that year, we got absolutely stuck by uh, Haslinden, I think, away. Anyone recall that at all? Stan, are you here? Oh, I, it was at home, weren't it? I think it was at home. Yeah, it was, yes, I, yeah, at home. Uh, I, can, I can remember his uh, probably mentality at club at the time, but I can remember his joining Haslinden at home and, and sort of some committee members being a bit happy about it that, you know, they didn't expect us to do anything in Cup, so they were happy that we'd drawn Aslan in because we'd get, might get a three or four hundred quid gate just from that one game. And that, yeah. that, was, sort of the, that was sort of the mentality, which I, I, I can remember thinking at the time, well, you know, we've had a decent start at the season. If we'd have got someone a bit, a bit more <coughs> out to beat, we could have had that Cup run. Yeah. But I, I can remember a couple of committee men being happy about us drawing Aslan in, which found strange. And I, I can remember us being in that game for a while, but it, the, it were, the wicket were really quick, weren't it? It was... <laughs> Floor house style and Paul Raffle. Can remember, Paul Raffle would stand on the helmet, didn't he? And Dave Wally had to clean up all, all plastic yeah. off Stan's broken helmet when he went into bat. But I can remember Raffle being particularly quick that day. Yeah, yeah, just coming back there, batted first 191. Flegs, you got six for there again, 21 overs. I bet we had him about 70 for six at one stage, something like that. Yeah, and then, so that is the game, is it? With, um, with, with Stan and the helmet? Yeah, yeah we're quick that day with Raffle. Yeah. yeah. Anyone else remember anything about that day? I didn't play. I think it was a rained off game from the week before. I think it was a replay day. Stanley, can you remember what Stan did when he played against Rifle the second time after he'd been hit on his helmet? Well, some some wag, I don't know who it were, put a put a, a, a plaster on his helmet, like a cross plaster in the middle of Stan's helmet, and just before he went out to bat, so he didn't realise and put it on. And. <laughs> I mean, we we all we all thought it was funny, but Paul Rifle didn't, did he? And uh, <laughs> it, it, it was, it was uh, Paul Rifle absolutely adamant that Stan would take piss out of him, and Stan, <laughs> Stan didn't know he had this big X marks to spot in the middle of his helmet. <laughs> yeah, I can, I can remember that. Yeah, the week before when he were bowling that quick rifle, I, I went out to bat with Chipper, and uh, we were about eighty for nine, and 
Bobby Grimshaw. We, did, we, we played a few overs back of Barry Knowles and I think Blomley were bowling. I put about 10 on me and chip and Bobby Grimshaw just said, oh, I won't throw up. And I said to Chip, I said, fuck this. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I tried to hit Barry, Barry Knowles for a few sixes and got stumped after I think the first ball, I think, <laughs> before yeah. not facing him when we needed 100 to win. Yeah, you did. Yeah, you did. <laughs> uh, so, did we ever find out who put the crosses on uh, Stan's helmets, Stan, eh? Well, uh, no, no. Dave Wally said it weren't him. <laughs> <laughs> well, that'll do then. That'll do. We all come from Morehouse, a little village town. Everybody knows us from our unique sound. We will sing a song for you and even fill your ground. Buy your ale and swell your purse. Right, so uh, Stanley, you've been a star on this. Your memory is unbelievable for us. So it's. Uh... I, won't, I won't say that. <laughs> <It's, it's, laughs> These are the things that go wrong for me, Jess. <laughs> so it tend to stick with me. Right. right. <laughs> so Stanley, then, did you did you come up to Middlesbrough with us when we went to play, when we went to VE Day? I did. That were a that were that were a, that were a trip and a half, weren't it? Got out of control quick. Did that one, didn't <laughs> I? <laughs> in ninety in ninety five, it was VE day, fiftieth VE day. All right. And Flags Flag said, "Well, I'm going up to Middlesbrough. It's like bank holiday Monday, probably." He said, "You know, we play." And he said, "We're going to go up to Middlesbrough and uh, you know see a few." Series of pals from where we were playing there, and they were playing a proper league game because they they were playing the league game on the bank holiday Monday. Yeah. So I don't know whether Flegs had already been up there. I think Flegs had gone up there on his own, and there were like five of us going up there: me, Stanny, Payne, your Matthew, Chippy, and, and uh, Proc went. Proc definitely Proc went. went. Yeah. Because I don't think I don't think me and Proc saw a ball bowled went straight oh. in bar and never come out. We had, uh, we had to we had to flip a coin for who was driving, and your Matthew won or well, lost as it were, as it turned out. <laughs> he had to stay sober whilst we were drinking. I think you were like VE day prices, so we were like two pence a pint. <laughs> <laughs> as you say, we saw very very little of the cricket. It was a very good standard, but we didn't see that much of it. There was a guy there who played first class cricket and he ended up backing his wife off home or his bird off home so he could stay with us for a couple of hours. Glenn, 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 Glenn something, what are you called? Glenn. Glenn Denning. John Glenn, Glenn Denning. Denning. Glenn Denning, yeah. 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 He ended up staying with us for a while. He was, I can remember him being good company. I thought Matt, Matt might have disappeared into Middlesbrough and found another hotel for you. <laughs> he must have had. To, he must have had to be somewhere on Tuesday because he was. He was not happy. No. <laughs> um, I've just got the uh, the list of professionals up for '96, and you look on there. Ben Johnson, seventeen hundred runs that year. Yeah, you know, that, that was phenomenal, weren't it? You know, Joe Scudery, thirteen hundred. Brad McNamara played. Dan Marsh, Harper, Marty, Chris Harris. You know, there's some uh, some significant. Chris Harris, what a, what a player he were. Yeah. yeah. What's um what's your memories of that season, uh, Flags? You personally didn't do as well as you did in the first year. I think we did yeah. you know, we did well. We we held our own and, and again it was a tight league and we finished at sixth the game. What was your memories for that, Flags? Yeah, we just I don't think we started off as well. Yeah, and personally I just yeah, I couldn't get a run or take a wicket for ages actually. So pretty disappointed. We started something the season before and really looking forward to building on that and you know I that was pretty frustrating, that, particularly that first half of the season. Did you find it difficult having had the first year to come back the second year? I've not really spoken to many people about this. You know, we've done one or two of these with pros who've done more than one year. Mm. When you come back the second year, obviously you, you're a bit more familiar with what you're going to face. It can all, it can, it can change. The weather can change, can't it? The you know, teams can change, pros can change. And whilst you're expecting possibly to have a little bit more knowledge, it doesn't take a great deal for what you're facing to be very different. Probably a little bit of that. And then, um, you know, the other players know you a little bit better as well. So, yeah. So going around, maybe they're a little bit more cautious. Yeah. So, it's probably a bit of both that, you know, I was expecting to do better 
probably other players had, had seen a bit of me the year before and where they decided to sit on me a little bit with the with the ball and realised I was just a slogger and I'd get out after a few dot balls as well. <laughs> Was that um, the season? Was that the season when actually to bowl a bit more Chinaman? Was that am I wrong? Yeah, that? yeah. At home, I was doing that. Yeah, so I was bowling, you know, Orthodox and and Chinaman. So I was a bit yeah. confused about what I wanted to do. And yeah, but that's not, it's not an excuse. You're getting paid to play the game and win games, and that expectation. It's more the expectation that you put on yourself. First season, I don't know. I think it's really important. Those first few games, you you actually have to prove yourself to your teammates and to the club that signed you. And in '96, I was you know, I wasn't doing that, so I felt that pressure, but it was, you know, I was disappointed that I wasn't doing that because I felt like we'd actually made a really good step and I was hoping to build on that. What's your memories of, of 96, Gary? You know, just looking at the averages, they're not as good. Our averages, I'm talking, you know, albeit Blaise got 704, um, Nicky and Matt got 300 and quite a few, but we didn't get the runs that we did get, and also looking, we didn't get as many wickets as we did in in '95. What's your memories of of that '96 season, Gary? Yeah, I can't remember a great deal about the start for some reason. I think we, had, I don't think we, I think generally overall '96. I think the thing that was having been really pleased with sort of like the the, the bowling unit, particularly. You know, I think we wanted to try and focus on how do we get another 15, 20 percent runs out of five or six amateurs, you know, I, I, how can we do that? And and it's difficult to coach that sort of stuff very quickly. I'm sorry, I can't coach because I'm not a coach, but, you know, in terms of how we, how we would do that, I think we tried to get better practice wickets on the square and things like that um, at that point to try, just try and help that and try and replicate some sort of match day conditions. Yeah. It, it just didn't come off. I don't know the reason for that, really. Whether, again, we just didn't have the, the match situations to, to, to for people to get a decent run at a decent innings. And I, I can't remember a lot about the, the early part of that season, I, I don't think. I was just looking. We did quite well at, early on in the season. We won quite a few and then went and really, really tailed off off quite badly. I mean, Fleg, you got 159 in one game. I'm just looking for that. Can you remember that one? I only got washed out. No. Against Accrington. No, no, we'll come on to that one. Yeah, right. That's, yeah. that's 144 runs, weren't it, against Todd, weren't it? Yeah, oh, yeah. 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 yeah it was 150 odd against Accrington. It was probably a couple yeah. of weeks before. I, I, can, I can remember most seasons around then that uh, we used to we used to do well early on in the season because of because of the style of his ball and attack, and the wickets were a bit softer and and seemed about a bit. We were a bit. We did seem to be quite successful, and then as it dried out. We weren't as quite successful, but also the fix. I used to think the fixtures used to stiff us as well because the three big teams, Raslind and Nelson and Baker, and we used to play them over. We used to play all them six fixtures over a three-week period, so we'd always have a really tough period in middle. Burnley if holidays. you look at the fixtures, we used to get we used to get Shaft there playing Skidori and all them guys back to back to back. You know, it was tough. It was tough. Period. I don't think we used to lose every one of them, but you know, we're, we're, we're always going to have that run just because of how it was set up. You know, I think Mishton were thrown in there as well. Yeah, well, so, I mean, I think '96 was um, a wetter summer than '95. I think we did get the the best of the weather the year before, and then it was relatively early, 26 of May flags when you got that 144 at home against Todd. And it's, I think Gary mentioned it. Gary, you opened the batting with uh, with flags on that game. And didn't you mention in previously about where Flegs was stood when he was facing uh, their bowling attack? Yeah, I think once once he got in the zone, it was um, it was stood a yard, three four feet outside leg stump, sort of just daring him to. Then because there was a shorter boundary, and the, which they were clearly trying to protect or bowl bowl to the longer boundary, and uh, and I'd not seen anything like that. I'd just sort of larping him, in, you know, from inside out. From a yard outside leg stick, it was amazing. Fantastic innings, clean hitting, you know, not edges everywhere or just trickling over boundary or a, or a load of drop catches. Fantastic stroke play, real clean hitting, 360 degree shots. It was it was, it was a fantastic inning. Yeah, I can remember the ball, the, the fielder coming from long off to give the ball an advice. Can you remember that? <laughs> we were all rolling around laughing. <laughs> <laughs> How are you supposed to ball at this? It's like what you want to do is you just get, wherever they bowl it, we're going over the wall. Aren't you? And then unfortunately the rain came and that got washed out and uh, and your 140 odd got washed out flex because you got a duck in the the next game. 
Stupid rule. Stupid rule. I mean, and that, that year was where a Motti prod at church, I think, that year, you know, before he came to pro for us. Did you know Motti? You will have known him then, wouldn't you, because you played some uh, some cricket with him back in Australia. Yeah, I mean, I first met Motti. Actually, I'll just tell a story about that when I got a duck. So Dan Marsh was the, the pro at Todd, and apparently they'd made, they'd spoken about it and said, if we get bugs out for a duck, we're going to do a dead ant on the pitch. Sees me getting out and you can see fielders doing a dead ant. Uh, <laughs> so Dan Marsh, Dan Marsh is now an assistant coach in Cricket Tasmania for the women's team. So he, he still brings that up sometimes. <laughs> uh, but Moddy, I met, uh, he's a couple of years younger than me, but I met him, <clears throat> uh, he would have been 15, 14, 15, Queensland schoolboys team. Yeah, I've known him for a bit over 30 years. Yeah, so we spent a fair bit of time that, that next year in, uh, he was living with Nick Westwell. Yeah, we spent a bit of time. He ran up the back of, after we played against each other at Lower House, had a couple of pints and I was following him back to his house. We were going out for the night. I remember it was a little bit slippery and I could see him. He's, he's like a goldfish, man. He sort of, you can't concentrate for too long. So I could see him in the rear vision mirror. He was trying to sort out the radio, the stereo on the, on the car. And it was a little bit slippery. It's coming up to the stoplight and I slowed down and he looked up and didn't put the brakes on in time, just bang into the back of me. So he had that this little red board festiva or something. So it was a big dint in the boot, in the, in the bottom of the car. We had to get out and push that down. So <laughs> Made no indent in my painters and dockers station wagon that I had from Chibi. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Brilliant. I mean, he, yeah, I mean, we're hoping, hoping to get Motti on so we can uh, have a good catch up with him. Uh, Ryan mentioned that he's, uh, he's not even dafter, which I find difficult to, uh, to believe. <laughs> but, uh, that's what Ryan Harris said. We played in, at our place, uh, church at our place. We didn't get a great score, I don't think, and they were wet and Motti got a, a, were getting plenty of runs against us. And there were a bit of a jab between you, between Sean and, and, uh, and Motti. Motti smashes the ball in the air, and I think you were at mid-off or something like that, Flag, and Jez were bowling, and there was nobody going to get in your way from catching that. You had to run, turn and run behind you, and nobody, no matter how many were going to get, you were going to catch Motti out that day, and it was just, OK, we got beat, but... I mean, that just like summed up uh, the... There were a lot of Australians, weren't there, in, in, in that season? In, I don't know whether it was an Ashes tour or whatever, but there, it just seemed to be week after week we were playing, you know, uh, two Australian mm -hmm. mates. Sort of thing. Yeah, Scott, Scott Williams played... Uh, Scott Bradley there. Williams. Yeah, very loose. You were mad. <laughs> yeah. Um, but that, yeah, that's that game, but uh, that's when Stanny dropped Moddy. Well, been a good one. Been a worldie. Been a worldie. <laughs> probably, probably still told me about Circle then. <laughs> Talk us through that, Danny. What happened? Flags bowled left arm Chinaman, which we're begging to be it. Right. And, and Marty, Marty hit it directly above his head. I mean, it went, it, but it did go high. It right. did go straight up. And uh, I didn't get, I sort of seem to remember not going into the best of positions to catch it, really. <laughs> Where did you it? It was right down, right down my throat and it hit my chest and hit my feet. And before I could recover it, it hit the, it hit the ground. Oh, dear. And then, and then he hit the next three on to Grangeman's up. All three on to Grangeman's up roof, one after the other. It was one of the first times, you know, like cricket had started to just move on, weren't it? And it was a, he hit three slog sweeps over my head. At, yeah, yeah, they were big hits, and you know, me, me and Flags were me and Flags were good mates at the time. You know, I used to, I realised why I used to have to buy all Alabama slammers in Panamas now because if you're only getting three thousand two hundred quid or whatever, Renners were paying him, it's been a tough gig. But um, but I can't, and it, I, it called me, I had my, it called me an incompetent fuck. That was my mate. <laughs> no, that, you know, so I, as he went on that time, I thought, well, I'm going to tell everyone what he said to me. Ben Sheil is in Panama on Thursday night. You know, I'm, when he said to him, I'm from Queensland where the sun shines free. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's got up, Stanley. 
It's gone it's up. In Asa. It's in Asa. But it did. It, 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 and it worked. It worked. But yeah, I'm from Queensland where the sun shines free. <laughs> I, I, said, I wouldn't take it personally, Stanley, that Flegs was uh, fallen out with you. It's because it was Motty. Well, I think, because I, yeah. I got Motty out next over, so it went on my telly anyway, Jess. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> you know, fast bowlers union. Yeah. <laughs> very very slow, medium pace union, should I say. <laughs> but again, that... And Flegs had to do some extra jobs, didn't he, Stanley? When he was living at Matt's, he used to polish his... Uh... Polish his sideboard, didn't he, at one stage? Didn't he, didn't he oh. do that? <laughs> what about his favourite little chores, polishing, polishing Matt's sideboard? Okay. <laughs> I can remember. Can you remember, Flag? Yeah. Can you remember John Hampshire, umpire? Yes. Well, I so he's mate, Flag's were mates with his son. So he invited yeah. him out. He invited him down to Burnley. We had a night out and we got absolutely shit faced. <laughs> And this, this John Hampshire's son was sleeping at settees at Matt's. I was asleep in the chair and Flegs and Matt must have gone to bed. Or we thought Flegs and Matt had gone to bed. And me and John Hampshire's son are in, in, in the door comes open and a woman from next door walks in. So what are you doing? And what they'd done, they'd dug Prince Pin Street up. It'd have been, it they must have been putting a new drain in or something. And this woman walked, me and John Hampshire's son up, dragged his outside, and Matt was asleep in, in to where they dug the road up. It, it was like <laughs> lead on one of them yellow water pipes, fast asleep. So we had to like drag Matt out to gutter, drag him back in house. But yeah, John Hampshire's only met him once. <laughs> we had to, to, to drag Matt out at gutter in Prince Street. I mean, I've nothing else saying the 96. Is there any other games or stories or anything that anyone else wants to discuss? I can't remember the game. We talked about this the, the other week on a podcast, you know, Sean's intensity and sometimes dressing room took a bit of a, a, a dent or some kit bags or an odd bat or three. And I can't remember the game. The, the only time I, I, I saw him really come close to lose it on the pitch was we were at home. You were bowling over the wicket for some reason. You got an LBW claim. As far as you're concerned, like every pro, it were it were out. Not you know, stone stone cold sober out. And this and this guy, the umpire, said he couldn't give it out because you'd stepped in front of him. <laughs> now there weren't there weren't many small umpires in the league, but you were only four foot six in your Cuban <laughs> heel. And 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 the incredulity of you saying that he couldn't see over you to 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 make this decision. And I think I had to step in because uh, Matt then got him, wanted to get involved from first split. On the pitch, as Jess said earlier, really sort of encouraging, motivational and, and determined and, and led from the front, really, in that respect. You handled me pretty well, Jess, to be honest. I, I didn't like not bowling most of the time, but, yeah. uh, but you handled me very well, so thank you, because <laughs> I was probably a pretty shit guy, the captain, I'd imagine. No, I don't think so. No, not at all. No, he's certainly a great player to play with and, uh, you know, it, the memories that you've you've had there. And it, maybe we should have had Matt on uh, for that few months that you stopped at um, Prince Street with him. We'll get some more stories out. Well, yeah, I stayed with him for the first season. Oh, was it the so, first season? Yeah. Yeah, you did, because I think he was, when, like I so said, when he picked you up from airport, I think the first time we clapped eyes on each other was down at Law House and I'm smashing all the wet damp plaster off the uh, home room changing rooms and it's a, you know probably doing about 500 pounds worth of improvements in the process and you walked in i can remember the look on your face seeing where am i is this the 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 grangsman's or something and like, oh this is your own changing room it was like okay it can only get better for me i sure <laughs> the change room was the interesting i mentioned phil simmons before and i reckon it's one of the worst cricketing days of my life playing against phil uh, he scored I reckon he got 150 against us, and they they got two 290 or something. I reckon, Gaz, you tell me that I was going to open to try and chase it down. I got out pretty cheaply to fill as well, so I think we got we got knocked over pretty pretty cheaply, and so I was pretty dejected sitting in that change room, and it was shared shared showers, wasn't it? So yeah. I mean, everyone else had gone up to into the, the bar to have a beer and I sort of wandered into the shower feeling pretty sorry for myself and there was just Phil 
lathering himself up afterwards. <laughs> I've just topped it off. <laughs> the worst going on. Cool. Thanks. <laughs> <Be better. laughs> Blaise, is there anything else? Is there anything you want to put on before we uh, I finish it up? No, we, we, the intention was, wasn't it, to sign Sean for the third season, wasn't it? Everything you know was going in the right direction. We wanted to sign Sean for the for the third season, but that's when the regulations came in, weren't it? About yeah. first last games. Yeah, I do remember that. Can you, you know, how how late? In the 96, 90, 96 season, were you told about that, Sean? It was really late. I reckon it was when it was the first sort of MOU was being signed, but like the Australian Cricketers Association. And I just, so Tim May was the head of the Cricketers Association. And I just remember getting an email from him or a call from him saying, the rules have changed. You've, you've got to have played you know, so many games for your state to go and play league cricket. That's not going to help me. Can't do it. So I think we looked into whether being 12th man would qualify because I was 12th man for a lot of games. Yeah. Um, that didn't seem to matter. Couldn't go. I was going to go to Brazil on the way over this time as well to a mate's wedding. So I was, <laughs> I was devastated. Oh, dear. No, you do. Extremely disappointing. Extremely. Especially bearing in mind the professional that we did get. But anyway, we're well, going to. I'm going to say there weren't much you could slip through, but we managed to slip through them regulations <laughs> into. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for definite. Anything else from yourself, Gaz? All being said, really, I think it was just a, 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 a. I remember it being a really enjoyable two years on and off the pitch, not just the match day cricket, just fe the feeling that collectively things have moved forward you know we were definitely a better club two years after you know Sean turned up and a better set of players and, and, and better outlook on cricket individually and I dare say if we'd have had the, the sort of amateurs that were knocking around in the 2000s late 2000s and, and, and early 2010 you know Sean's a professional with all sort of performances on those days I, I think you know the, the, those would have been championship winning sides. Not a problem. It wasn't a reflection of Sean that we didn't win anything. The, the number of times through that decade that you can look at and and say, yeah, that wasn't revolutionary. It was a start of then with the Stan bringing the young, youngsters through that things turned for the better. I think if you look at it sort of chronologically, it, that season, the '96 season, was when Charlie Charlie made his debut in '96, and you know, obviously Charlie's. Generation of rugrats, Gav, Matt Marquis, yeah. Little Stanny to a certain extent, but not, you know, as Paul would attest to it, not a big extent. But it, it was that next generation of our cricketers that, that sustained us through to the early 2000s. And it was very important that they had a role model like Sean at practice when, when they were 15, 16, that I think made them aware of what it took to be a professional cricketer you know, a demanding professional cricketer of the standards that they had there. And it no sort of uh, coincidence that Charlie came to be one of the best fielders in the league, not only with natural talent, but by how hard he worked, you know, at practice, you know, from, from those early days. The beginning. 16. Yeah, without a doubt. Without a doubt. Stanley, anything just to want to, uh, to sum up, to round it off before I get on to flags? Well, just, I mean, if you, if you can ever, I mean, the nice thing I can say about it is if you could ever be transported back, that's, that's a period I'd like to go back to, you know, sort of 90, because it was, it was, I mean, it was a pleasure to play with legs. But also, you know, these things, these things have changed. Like, I want to like to got nicked again, like I did in 92, or I want to like to, <laughs> I want to got, get engaged to a lunatic, like I did in 1994, but. But you know the, the the main the main points of it were uh, like I say it was just so pleasurable and especially ninety five ninety six but my two favourite years at Law Race far on you know yeah yeah without a doubt you know and I can only echo that flags is there anything else you want to sum up flags before we uh, before I close this podcast oh, I said at the start I absolutely loved playing at Lower House it was a great family club you know you guys made me feel extremely welcome. From the first night I turned up, so you know, thank you very much. Because it's yeah, you you want to go over and, and play good cricket, but you want to uh, meet good people and um, and have a great time as well. I certainly met some outstanding people and and had a great time on and off the field. It was, it was brilliant. 
Yeah, I still can't believe it's 25 years. That's uh, is it scary. scary. You're not bitter about Stanley's catch still then? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but he, he actually has to come on. He'd be on the back. Very fair. Yeah. I need closure. <laughs> yeah, I needed some closure around it. Um, all right, then, Flegs, thanks ever so much for uh, appearing on the, the housecast. It's really appreciated. All the fans will will enjoy listening to you. And, and the younger fl- fans that, that didn't watch you play, I'm sure they would look at your figures now. And, you know, if we can reiterate to them, you know, try and emulate what this lad did, how, how keen he was for the club. Thanks ever so much, Flegs, for coming on here and joining us. And hopefully we'll speak soon and um, next time in the UK I'm sure you'll come and visit us thanks very much yeah. Flex. we have we have improved the dressing rooms as well they are they are habitable now yeah <laughs> Panama Panama Jaws is shut Flex. <laughs> <laughs>